Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Father Michael Gately, author of 33 Days to Morning Glory. We'll watch a Cool to be Catholic short film called Keep the Faith Alive. We'll build the faith with Brother Leo and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight, our guest is Father Michael Gately. He is a father, a Marian father of the Immaculate Conception. He's a noted author. I caught up with him at a focus conference, and in the interview, he told us about his devotion to Our Lady. Remember, he wrote the book, 33 Days to Morning Glory, a very popular book. And it's all about consecrating ourselves to Our Lady. So he shares with us about his own relationship with the Blessed Mother. We'll also be watching a video by Brother Leo on building your faith. We now go to a cool to be Catholic short film, Keep the Faith Alive by James LaPlante. These days, people tend to view the church as something old and archaic. Something they hope will pass away with time. But we're not gonna let the church fade away. The answer is living our everyday lives in the presence of Christ, offering to Him our prayers, our works, our joys, and our sufferings. It simply requires that we live our everyday lives in service of Christ, offering everything up to Him for His greater glory. This is how we keep the faith alive. Father Michael Gately, and I'm sure a lot of people know about you from your books, uh, especially 33 Days to Morning Glory, about uh, reflection on the 33-day consecration of St. Louis to Montfort. It got my attention when a lot of the local parishes back home were using this to help people enter into the consecration. Uh, tell us a little bit about the origin, what that book's about. Sure. Uh, 33 Days to Morning Glory is a, a 33-day preparation for doing a total consecration of Jesus through Mary. And it basically uh, helps summarize the Marian teaching on Marian consecration of St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Kolbe, Mother Teresa, and John Paul II. And so um, you usually begin about 33 days before a major Marian feast day. And then you sort of walk through the teaching of those saints and then consecrate yourself to Jesus through Mary on the feast day. Amen. Is uh, St. John Paul II your favorite Mariologist? <laughs> Actually, you know, my favorite is St. Maximilian Kolbe. I love John Paul II yeah, too, but yeah. I, I love St. Maximilian Kolbe a lot. And his is really dense. Uh, what was his gift to Mariology, you think? Saint Ma I, for, I think St. Maximilian Kolbe's great gift is that he brings the church to a deeper understanding of Mary as the Immaculate Conception. Uh, what particularly struck him was when Mary revealed herself uh, at Lourdes to St. Bernadette and said, I am the Immaculate Conception. And Colby um, reflected on that saying, why did Mary not say I was immaculately conceived? Rather she said, I am the Immaculate Conception. And as Colby pondered that over the years, uh, he came to the conclusion that Mary called herself the Immaculate Conception. She said, I am the Immaculate Conception because the Holy Spirit is also the Immaculate Conception. He said the bond between the Holy Spirit and Mary is so close that Mary takes his very name because within the Trinity, uh, he's a sinless conception of love, life and love. And uh, so Mary takes the name of her spouse. And so what Colby gives to the church is that reflection of Mary as the Immaculate Conception, spouse of the Holy Spirit, the one through whom, which the, th the, one through whom the Holy Spirit uh, loves to work and, and, and bring his grace. Some of our Protestant brothers and sisters, and even John Paul himself, I think, talked about in his early days, he worried about being distracting from Jesus, this devotion to Mary. How do you answer that? 
Uh, there's a line that uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe uses a lot when sometimes people would ask him, are we giving too much emphasis? They're maybe afraid of loving Mary too much. And Maximilian Kolbe would say to them, uh, you can never love Mary too much uh, because you'll never love her as much as Jesus loved her. And um, uh, the idea is, what I would say to like Protestants or people who are concerned with that, um, you know, after writing the book, 33 Days to Morning Glory, I've gotten thousands of letters probably at, at, by this point. And um, the majority of them are testimonies as to how a deepening relationship with Mary has brought them more deeply into the love of Jesus. And so um, the heart of the Christian life is a personal relationship with Jesus and his mercy. But the testimony of the saints and the testimony of many of the people I've met over the years is that Mary is incredibly effective in helping us to deepen our relationship with Jesus because Mary was the closest disciple of anyone to Jesus. Uh, she was his mother and uh, she loved him and listened to him and followed him. And so she's a great example for all Christians um, because of her closeness to Jesus and, uh, and in my own life personally, I've, I've found that as well. So, so it's just a matter of trying it and yeah. you'll see that it, it brings to a deeper love for Jesus. Hey, can you talk about uh, this past, this moment we're in, this past century, we have Fatima and John Paul and Maxime mm -hmm. and Colby, uh, the Sister Faustina, the message of divine mercy. Wrap it all together and explain it to us. <laughs> yeah, um, okay, I would say the heart of it for me is uh, Romans 5 verse 20 where it says, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. Uh, John Paul II, he saw that while the modern world has many blessings, there's also a sense in which the modern world is marked by unprecedented evil. Uh, but John Paul II was someone who was filled with hope. And again, that was because of Romans 5 verse 20, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. In a time of great evil, God gives even greater grace. And in a time of, in a certain sense, unprecedented evil, God gives extraordinary mercy. And so um, the testimony of Saints Therese, Faustina, uh, Maximilian Kolbe, John Paul II, I think these are all saints that the Holy Spirit raised up to be signs of hope for us in the modern world uh, that as Jesus told Faustina, I do not wish to uh, punish aching mankind, but to draw it close to my, to my sacred heart. And so um, it's a really, the heart of the testimony of those saints is that this is a time of mercy. It's a time to draw closer to Jesus. Um, Pope Francis has really followed up from uh, Pope John Paul II's intuition to be repeating that message over and over. That this is a time of mercy. You know, he saw that the image of the church right now is that of a field hospital after battle. At the beginning of his pontificate, he said that, and he's been saying that something similar all along, is that um, what I think the Holy Spirit is doing for the whole church is bringing the church back to the center of the gospel, the heart of the gospel, getting us back to the, the foundation of everything, which is God's mercy for sinners, that he doesn't love us because we're so good, but because he's so good. And, uh, and that's the good news. And part of that, receiving that mercy is showing it to others. And, yeah. and you do work with the uh, Marian Missionaries of Divine Mercy. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I belong to a religious congregation called the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. And I worked at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, uh, but we didn't have an outreach for the poor. And so I, I got per, received permission from my provincial uh, to work in starting an organization called the Marian Missionaries of Divine Mercy. And it's basically uh, young men and women who give a year to basically have a ministry of presence with the homeless in uh, New York City and Boston and then the Northeast. And uh, I am sort of their spiritual director. I do masses for them and uh, formation classes for them. But um, it's a really uh, beautiful year. Uh, and, and those who go through it, it's kind of a time for discernment or just kind of sometimes figuring out uh, where they're going. And it's, it's been a real blessing for them yeah, and for me. What advice would you give? Uh, let's jump back to Mary a second. To, sure. In, in devotion to Mary, praying to her. Uh, what are some practical tips for that? Well, <clears throat> of all the titles of Mary, I think the one that resonates most with me, and I think it's the one the church emphasizes the most, 
is Mary as mother. <clears throat> and so for me, I think um, my favorite sort of Marian prayer is the same one Maximilian Kolbe talked about. And that is that um, I, I sometimes, I worry a lot, I try not to. I sometimes succumb to anxiety. I'm a sort of, I don't have the greatest nerves. <laughs> and especially when there's pressures and things like that. And uh, what those saints that I mentioned before in that book, and especially Maximilian Kolbe have taught me is, I just call out to Mary. Uh, Pope Francis talks about Mary as the undoer of knots. And when I'm feeling like really stressed and worried and having anxiety, I just call to Mary as my mother and just um, like a child, like just, I don't know how to do this or yeah. this. And just, it's uh, simply calling, use it, calling on her name and uh, that's a recommendation I give to the people why is just call in the name of Mary. Yeah. And uh, it's, the, the saints say it's very powerful. Yeah. I was listening to a, a Protestant podcast the other day. I love this show. They obviously love Jesus, very devout. They were talking about Mary and it just fell so short and flat. And it struck me, you know, these are people of faith, but it's almost like something about our belief and devotion to Mary has to be revealed to us. I think there's a special, there's a kind of veiling about it. And could you talk about that? Uh, like maybe Jesus' gift from the cross of Mary to us, which I think is such a huge moment that many have written about it, but do we really get how big a moment that is as he's dying on the cross to give us Mary to be our mother? Yeah, that's, I mean, for me, that that is Jesus is, as he's dying on the cross, the idea that um, he would give us that parting gift of Mary as our mother when he said, woman, behold your son, and then son, behold your mother. Um, uh, you know, you, you said <clears throat> there's sometimes a veil or sometimes a difficulty for people appreciating that. I think that's a mystery to me um, because really with the gift that Jesus gave to us and giving us Mary, as he's dying on the cross and he knew that he'd called all of us to take up our, our crosses daily and follow him. He knew we'd go through suffering. We all go through suffering. And he wanted us all to have no less of a consolation than he had, his mother as our spiritual mother. And uh, why someone wouldn't want that tender motherly presence in their lives, it doesn't take away from Jesus, but helps us to carry our cross and follow Jesus. I, I don't know, it's something a mystery. I think part of that mystery is um, there is an evil uh, power that is at work in the world, Satan, and he doesn't want us to be happy. He doesn't want us to know Jesus. He doesn't want us to ex experience consolation in our suffering. And so I, I wonder if maybe he has something to do that, of veiling people's eyes to that gift that Jesus himself wanted to give to us. And what do you think about now in this point of history, we seem to have had a, a grace-filled Marian moment, so to speak, uh, with a, such Marian popes and things and Fatima and approved apparitions. Why now? Why do you think it's now? Because we need it. I said if Jesus gave us Mary from the cross, because he knew we were going to go through suffering so that she could be a mother to console us. Because mothers are good at comforting their children, right? Yeah. Um, I think uh, Mary's at work so much because in our culture, uh, there's so many people who get churned up uh, by, and spit out by the culture of death and there's so much brokenness. And um, that's why it's the time of mercy. And that's why this is sort of a time of Mary too, is because Mary is sort of a manifestation of God's mercy. And uh, our merciful Father sees our need for that, that tenderness and that comfort. And so I think he gives us this time of mercy and he gives us this time of Mary too, because we need it. And in your own story, did you have like a conversion experience that brought you to the priesthood? And <laughs> you grew up devout Catholic or? Yeah, I'm having the conversion experience every day. I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm needing it at least. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, when I was in college, um, I was going back and forth between uh, thinking about getting married, which I really wanted to get married, yeah. but I felt Jesus called me to be a priest. And I remember I went to the chapel one day and I was actually looking at um, a San Damiano cross. And, uh, and this, it is, not, is very rare in my life, but at that time I felt like the Lord spoke to me, not with my ears, but in my heart. And I felt like he saw me wrestling and I remember he was very gentle. And I felt like he said, uh, Michael, you can get married and you'll be very happy. And if you choose that path, I won't love you any less. But I want you to be a priest. Will you quench my thirst for souls? 
And I remember when I heard those words in my heart, what came rushing to my mind was all the blessings that I'd received in my life. Um, and I said, Lord, if, if I say no, who would say yes? <laughs> Fine, I'll do it. <laughs> but I wasn't happy at it about it at the time. Cause I, saw that, I thought the priesthood was just this, gonna be this long, lonely, miserable life. Yeah. And uh, I didn't realize now what I realized. It's certainly a life of sacrifice, uh, but it's your life of uh, tremendous joy. And I wouldn't change it for anything, but, but at the time, that was, it was that invitation of Jesus. Uh, from the cross. And what has been some, of, we've got a couple minutes, what is sure. some of the joys of the priesthood you've experienced? The greatest joy for me uh, really has been um, two. One, to be able to, I have a Marian father of the Immaculate Conception. Our mission is to proclaim divine mercy. Jesus told Faustina that priests who proclaim my mercy, I anoint their words with power. And preaching about mercy has been such a gift because you can see on people's faces what Jesus said to Faustina about priests is really true. That when you talk about mercy, uh, you could see it in people's hearts. The second thing that's been one of the greatest joys of being a priest for me has been working with the, that group, the Marian Missionaries of Divine Mercy. Um, I, I'm a bit of an introvert and I wasn't sure how I would handle doing formation work. And uh, working with these young people who uh, you know, spent, uh, generously spend time with the poor and then come back and tell me their stories. and. Uh, it's just been a huge uh, blessing and gift for me to, to hear that and uh, to just spend time with them and to see God working in their lives. So, yeah, those have been two big gifts for me. Well, thank you so much, yeah. Father, for talking with us. Thanks for having me on, Mark. Father Mark. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
the time period was different. So you have to understand that. So if you want to get the understanding, the literal meaning, meaning of what the Bible is trying to say, what each book of the Bible is trying to say, you need to know those different aspects. And so if you read paragraph 109 to 110 of the Catechism, it goes through a number of different things that you need to understand in order to get the literal meaning of the Bible. Tonight we had a video from the Bison Catholics. They're uh, students from the North Dakota State University, a Newman Center up there. They have a thriving university center, um, a lot of focused missionaries, and they had a wonderful theme about keeping the faith alive. They did, and just, you know, just real practical stuff too, just being part of a community that really does build faith whenever we share it with others, uh, and just really diving into the prayer, to studies, you know, studying the catechism. Uh, praying the rosary together, praying, even going in front of the Blessed Sacrament, you know, as a group, maybe offering an attention, that builds faith, right. you know, concretely. So, right. yeah. And Leo, Brother Leo gave us some pointers about reading Scripture and understanding that literal meaning of Scripture, taking account the literary form that's used. Is it a historical book or is it an allegory or is it poetry? You know, certainly the Word of God, prayerfully reading that Word is a way to encounter, to keep the faith alive, to yeah. foster that faith in us. And then my father, Michael Gately, talked about devotion to Our Lady, that she helps bring us to Jesus, that she is truly our spiritual mother, that she nurtures that faith uh, within us. You know, she brings that, that Christian life to a, a deeper level in us and helps us to grow in the faith. You know, mothers are all about nurturing, bringing forth life. So to help you in your walk of faith, to keep that, that faith rich and vibrant, have a devotion to Our, to our Lady. You know, Jesus loved her more than we ever could. So we'll never yeah. take anything away yeah. from don't Jesus. Don't abandon the mother. <laughs> yeah, don't abandon the mother. Don't abandon the son. So that's our, our challenge. Our end of the vineyard challenge this week is keep the faith alive. Practice the faith. Live it. Do these devotions we're, we're talking about to help cultivate your faith. And we'll send you into that vineyard with a blessing. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock.